and welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, Reentry Planning Healthy Buildings. I'm Kay Bechtold, Managing Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of AIHA. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and especially SGS Golson for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today is Ron McMahon, Director of Business and Solution Development at SGS Golson. Ron has been at the forefront of applying burgeoning technology to real-time applications for over 30 years. He leads the marketing and business development team at SGS EHS USA and works with staff and clients to develop innovative ways to make sampling simpler. These extend to developing new instrument concepts to automated processes that benefit clients, including leading the innovation team on SGS Galson, Galson, excuse me, revolutionary monitoring and media management systems. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Ron. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, this is going to be hopefully a very interactive session. It's uh, obviously a topic that is on everyone's mind, and uh, I would imagine a great deal of uh, the people around this call are involved in uh, trying to help uh, companies, schools, and, and people in general to get back into buildings or to travel or to uh, get theme parks opened up and, and all kinds of things. So there's um, uh, this is a very, very timely topic, and, and thanks for having me, and thanks to all of you out there for uh, trying to get us back up and running effectively. Um, so the first thing, just to point out, obviously, there's been a lot of confusion. There's a lot of changing regulations, uh, not only CDC uh, guidance, but state guidance, even in some cases, company guidance uh, and travel uh, type guidance. Um, that is a never moving topic. And so, um, you know, this 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 talk is put together to get us all thinking about uh, how we can implement the best um, things that we can do to go forward. And everyone has a lot of ideas out there. And so this is really a talk to stimulate those ideas, um, to put some things out that maybe people haven't thought of. And uh, I worked with Ed Stuber on, on this talk. And, you know, Ed and I, were, we were sitting there, we were thinking about how this aligns directly with uh, uh, you know, AIHA and how a certified industrial hygienist works to make um, the worker safe. So, when you start looking at it from that perspective, uh, it really starts to draw such a uh, amazing uh, correlation to work hazards. Uh, at the end of the day, we're now dealing with a new work hazard, and it just happens to be everything affiliated with everyone going back into any facilities or any actor, uh, interactions with people. And we know there's a lot of confusion out there. We all see it uh, and everyone on this call. Probably your primary job has been to try and help clear up some of that confusion. So maybe this will help from how we're thinking about it um, to, to relay this and, and it's something we never really, I gotta be honest, I never ever thought about pure IH on this, uh, but it, it really has come down to it because it involves so many elements of what uh, certified industrial hygienists do for a living. So, the, so when Ed and I started putting this together, um, it really looked at the core assessment strategy that's utilized by IHs around the world. And it really starts with characterizing the hazard, what are the, uh, what are the hazards, what's the route of exposure, uh, what's acceptable, what's, you know, what's uncertain, is there a way, some way to control it, uh, and how do we get better at it? And so with the, with the opportunity now with people reentering, it becomes even more critical that these principles are applied by all of us to try and help get people back into business, uh, businesses safely, get kids back into school safely, uh, get travel safer. Um, and it's just, it fits the model so well for what we do um, uh, at uh, anything to do with industrial hygiene. So today's talk, using that principle, we're gonna go through and just in a very rough cut way, and everyone has a lot of opinions and, and things about this, but uh, we're just gonna back off to base, basically 20,000 feet and go, what are what are we really trying to prevent? What are the hazards? And we're gonna treat this just like a regular exposure assessment and see what we can do uh, technology-wise and just from a practical standpoint to help make sure we're doing the best we can to, to get people back into buildings. So the first thing, obviously, we got to do is recognize and characterize the hazard. That's the first piece of any industrial hygiene study. Uh, what are the hazards? Recognize them and characterize them. So when we look at characterizing the hazard, 
you know, the hazard of SARS-CoV-2, which creates um, COVID and the disease. And when we look at characterizing that exposure, uh, we know that there is a certain amount of virus that we can breathe in or deal with in our bodies over a period of time. But at the end of the day, you know, probably acceptability and targets, uh, we set them at zero. We wanna do everything we can to prevent any transmission of the hazard, SARS-CoV-2. So the first thing is recognizing and characterizing that hazard. And that is what we think, and probably a lot of other people think are the right way to approach this. If we can attain zero, then we could probably be successful in, in reducing in, uh, risk and, and, and get exposure down so that we don't spread uh, the disease. The sixth thing, the second thing is how does it spread? Just like any other hazard, is it airborne? Is it, you know, uh, how can it enter our bodies? What are the ways it does that? And so the next step in the process is to, ex is to examine what are the exposure pathways? How can we contract uh, SARS-CoV-2 and where does it come from? So again, this is, this is sort of just our thought on it and trying to break it down into a very basic way so that you can address the particular pathways. So the first one, uh, obviously, is person to person. Um, just being close contact with someone that may have the disease and being able to spread it through personal contact. The second is aerialization. Uh, you know, during the beginning of this uh, of this whole thing, it was uh, aerosol was not as heavily considered as transmission uh, through uh, touching or uh, you know fomite. But aerialization now is is known to be probably one of the major ways that this disease gets spread, just through airborne methods. And then the last is fomite. It's the transfer of someone, uh, you know, releasing uh, the virus onto a surface somewhere. Uh, someone touching that surface, touching their mouth, uh, their nose area, inhaling it through that, um, and uh, this still remains uh, one of the exposure pathways. So let's take a look at the exposure assessment uh, from person to person. How does that happen? How does, and again, I know this sounds very basic, but for Ed and I, when we went through this, it was really so fundamental just to look at it this way so that we could get grounded on what people can do from an industrial hygiene standpoint and how critical industrial hygienists are to make sure that these things are identified properly and, and we show a step-by-step -step process of reduction of risk and hopefully achieving target of no transmission. So the first is person-to-person -person interaction. The second is aerosolization, right? So person-to-person -person is interaction, touching. Uh, the next is aerosolization, ventilation systems, airflow patterns, um, how, do, how does the air uh, how, how is the air transmitted throughout a building, throughout a situation, uh, not just being close to someone, but can it move between uh, HVAC systems, within one HVAC system, uh, and those type of things. And the last one, again, is fomite. Uh, any area where there can be an accumulation of the virus, uh, areas that people touch a lot, people that, uh, you know, uh, common area, uh, you know, everything got down to, you know, even elevator keys, uh, what are the areas that can provide that uh, that fomite capability, those surfaces that they, we could transmit uh, the disease or the, the virus? So the next step, obviously, would be then we take a look at the control design implementation and verification of, of what can we do? How do we prevent these uh, uh, exposure paths from occurring? What are some of the tools available to us? Uh, how would we approach this to put uh, some control in place to try and prevent the spread of the virus. So again, following down the pattern of the first uh, pathway is person to person. So um, again, a lot of this has been implemented. Uh, social distancing, the number one thing is just don't be close to people, uh, you know, stay six feet apart, whatever the guidance is, uh, so that we prevent, try to prevent the person to person um, uh, transmission. The next thing was is PPE. Uh, you know, the, the mask uh, rules uh, going from masks don't need to be worn to everybody needs a mask, we need to double up masks. Um, and for an industrial hygienist, uh, this is huge because one of the biggest things industrial hygienists specify and try to, to maintain and help clients with or their own workforce is making sure PPE is, is applied appropriately, that it fits properly, that it is the proper way to approach this hazard. Um, and it turns out that PPE could be absolutely one of the biggest things in this whole line of defense. 
Uh, and then the next thing is just general hygiene practices, cleaning, uh, you know, uh, cleaning surfaces, cleaning your hands, washing your hands, staying, uh, practicing good hygiene so that uh, people are not um, transmitting it because they they actually are not transmitted because they don't have it on their hands because it's been cleaned or picking up from a surface because a surface has been cleaned effectively. So person to person is a, is a very big pathway and all these things need to be uh, looked at carefully and not just put a bandaid on it. CIHs don't put bandaids on things. They try to solve through control, design out something or control it or provide some protection that's gonna work. And, and what we're seeing today in this particular area, we'll get into in more detail, uh, this is an, a major um, Band-Aid. There's a lot of Band-Aids being applied to this particular route transmission. So social distancing, uh, again, uh, you know, what today uh, there's signage, uh, there's all kinds of things to be done to say, hey, maintain your distance. Uh, and, you know, there's CDC guidance, there's all kinds of guidance. Um, I was on a plane recently and there was no social distancing. Uh, aircraft are now being uh, packed back to, you know, back to their original, you know, no empty seats. Uh, and so the advisories and things that are out there, are they being adhered to? Are they, are they, are they really being done? Uh, but social distancing is, dump, is something that we definitely need to try and implement as much as possible. Because uh, it does help, it is it is a way to help prevent that person to person exchange, uh, and a lot of that comes down to following CDC advisory uh, guidance. The other thing is training. Again, CIH is one of the biggest part of uh, industrial hygiene is to train people on the things that we're going to do to mitigate risk and to avoid uh, exposure. So training has got to be included. It's it's a critical piece of it all. Uh, and then there's a technology piece that you can actually do some monitoring. Uh, this is one area that gets pretty touchy because people don't want Big Brother watching them. And, and you know, there's all those things. I don't want you to be monitoring me. Uh, there's a lot of privacy rights that have to be dealt with. But there is technology that can help provide some capability of ensuring uh, social distance guidelines in a facility, especially. This is an example of monitoring application. If you see the top right corner and, and you, you'll get a copy of this presentation, but literally being able to determine how many people are in a meeting space, uh, how many people are in a certain office uh, and keeping track of that. So that from a, uh, from an implementation standpoint, you can get notified immediately that there is an issue uh, or if someone does uh, test positive, a way to very quickly look back and see who could have been exposed uh, to that particular individual. So this kind of technology is available. It does require, you know, some some interaction with technology and things. Again, people knowing that they're somewhat tracked. Uh, but this type of tech is out there, not not just from MCS. There's a lot of systems out there today that provide this type of monitoring application to help uh, monitor uh, for proximity of people to each other. PPE is absolutely one of the biggest things, uh, in, and we at SCS. Uh, have a lot of exposure to people that are testing PPE. We actually have a very large filtration PPE testing company uh, in uh, the Midwest, and they are continuously pointing out uh, the issues with some of the PPE being provided. Some of the standards for PPE. What are you know? What are the the standards, and how do we you know how do we make sure as industrial hygienists we're meeting the standard? What about fit and form and training? Uh, how to apply a mask, how to take off a mask, what do you do with the mask when you're done? Uh, it's being cleaned, is, is when it's clean, it goes through that process, does it lose its ability to do some uh, capture that people are claiming or thinking it does? So it's it's a, uh, this has got to be one of the biggest areas right now that could be improved if we just make sure that the PPE is applied uh, practically and effectively with different people uh, in their job function. Uh, this is something that IH has been doing forever the application of PPE, and this is one area that uh, really can't be overlooked because it's just such a critical part of, of trying to keep the people from transmitting uh, the virus. Again, the last thing, hy hygiene practices, uh, you know, wash hands often, all these type of things, and again, training, monitoring, uh, and making sure that people are following it once it's in place. Um, and this is, again, something that I'm sure all of you have put, you know, been a part of the signage, the training and things for companies as they come back to their offices. 
Um, so uh, again, just a very important piece of the puzzle. Aerosols, again, aerosols have now probably been in, and this fits into a lot of other categories, including PPE that we're talking about, but there is a lot of activity regarding aerosol transmission and it, that industry uh, is growing tremendously. Um, and I'm sure some of you, and we've done a lot of tests with you uh, to uh, test uh, efficacy of certain claims of different um, different systems that emit different compounds. Uh, are they are they safe? Are they not safe? Does it really do anything? Um, you know where where is uh, this? You know your HVAC system as far as fresh air makeup and control of airflow. Um, you know what's the efficiency of your filters? Uh, is it an overkill? Is it work right? What's the, you know, what's the maintenance on that? There's so many pieces to this puzzle that uh, just can help prevent uh, the spread through aerosolation. Uh, one of the, one of the things that we really, we really believe in at SDS and, and uh, is uh, tracing aerosols. Uh, there's been smoke tests, there's different uh, methods for tracing uh, airflow in a building using tracer substances. Uh, but with some tools, such as Veridart, uh, done by Safetrace, uh, our partner in this, uh, they developed this technology, and now you can do multiple DNA tracers, emit aerosol, and basically be able to track where they're going. Is the, uh, the filter media working effectively? Uh, is there something in the HVAC system that's you know spreading at the different areas? Are there collection points? And it's really interesting that a lot of money has been spent, a tremendous amount of money on different uh, fluid dynamic modeling and all these things and their models and theories a lot of times and the big advantage to this system like these type of systems is that now you can run an actual experiment to validate the theory or what you think is the solution and we think it's invaluable to be able to provide that system so that you can get validation experimental validation real time real world in in the in the facility in the application to make sure whatever's been installed is working effectively. And so these are tools that we think are ultimately uh, just so critical to make sure that you're able to ensure uh, the occupants that uh, things are working effectively as they should should have been based on design and also to save companies money to not provide overkill. And in these applications, uh, there's the, you know, the ability to test your dilution. Is your fresh air make, makeup actually working? Uh, is it being activated properly? Is it efficient? Is it energy efficient? Uh, filter, is your filter system that you used, is it working effectively or not? Is it removing uh, aerosols from the air or not removing aerosols? And then finally, the ability to see these accumulation points based on multiple releases uh, around an office or a facility and, and actually testing and verifying uh, that there is some collection points or areas that need to be uh, looked at or HVAC systems need to be tested again uh, or revalidated to make sure filters are sealed properly all those type of things uh, and it's just a really critical part for making sure that we know where the aerosols are headed and is what we're doing to prevent the buildup of aerosol effective or not effective air treatment uh you know these are uh doing efficacy tests we've done a lot of this um, other companies have done a lot of it trying to validate that some of these systems are uh, actually reducing viral load uh, there's a Big thought that really over time, it's <laughs> the the virus doesn't last long, typically. And you know, do we need all these FC items to try and uh, treat that? So there's a lot of tests, a lot of things go on in this in this area. If you uh, are looking at this, or you would like you know some uh, contacts at different labs that do you know actually validate uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, testing results, a lot of the manufacturers of these devices place them online. Uh, so you can get to that data, but if you want to talk to experts in the field, we've worked with some of these folks uh, that actually are the lab level you need to be to be able to handle live viruses. So this is an interesting area, uh, and uh, we've done a lot of tests, not only for the FC part, but also is it safe whatever's being used to be able to treat that air? Is there ozone generation, hydrogen peroxide generation, other things being generated that could potentially be worse than uh, compared to what the effectiveness does is of result of the uh, reduction of the hazard through whatever treatments being claimed. So again, this is a big piece of, of testing and making sure that the aerosols are right, uh, are being reduced the best we can uh, through whatever method and a way to validate it. 
So uh, several labs are capable of doing uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in air. We do a lot of it. Uh, we have a couple of clients that this is a big piece of it. Uh, and again, there's there's ways to do it. And you know, it comes down to uh, this is a real test in air. What do you do when you get the response? How do you handle it? Uh, but we have the tool set to do these things, and so do other labs. And uh, this is another option, something you can do effectively uh, to determine if you do have airborne aerosols that are containing the uh, the virus. And then fulmite, uh, again, cleaning and disinfecting, trying to get rid of touch uh, points is critical. Um, all these things, you know, it's just, it's what we've been doing. It's one of the first things that took place. And again, these things can SARS-CoV-2 can actually be tested on services. A lot of people are using ATP and other things to test for cleanliness. Uh, you know, it's not a direct read, but it is an implied uh, test to say, yes, did somebody clean this area effectively? But at the end of the day, you also can do uh, the SARS-CoV-2 on services and, and just to validate things. Again, is a lot of people don't think it's oil, well, they'll think it's overkill or it's not necessary, but in some required, you know, in some required areas, it may be worthwhile to do these tests just for validation that it is being cleaned effectively and there isn't a transmission uh, via uh, these methods. So one of the things that's really interesting is we see a lot of companies, uh, lots of companies, if not the majority of companies, uh, put these things that they do the testing, they do the evaluation, they do the exposure assessments. Um, CIHs come in, hopefully CIHs, and they give advice. Uh, they, they say, here's here's what you need to do. Uh, they run a Barrett Art study, they do a filter test, they do all these things. And they go, okay, you're good to go. Um, and that's it. So now everyone, you can get back into your building. But part of the problem with that, we feel, is somebody needs to be auditing and monitoring that because just like any other IH study, you know, we, we do it, you know, maybe annually, depending on the change of the situation, something moving, changing. In this situation, because we're trying to achieve zero. It only makes sense that what we're going to do is we're going to do some things to try and continuously monitor to validate whatever solutions we've put in place stay effective. Um, you know, there's a lot of building standards. There's lead. There's well. There's different tests you can do, and they're annual. There, there, there's an annual follow up and things like that. Uh, but again, uh, from an industrial hygiene standpoint, is that really effective in what we're trying to achieve to reduce these exposure pathways? Or do we need to be more aggressive in monitoring these things and being more diligent? And and I, and I don't probably shouldn't say the way I'm going to say it, but this false sense of security. So as IHs, we know that in a building situation, different levels of occupancy, different uh, entryways, somebody able to manipulate HVAC systems, someone, someone being able to shut the fresh air makeup, mechanical uh, design system, whatever, things are moving. And in that application, wouldn't it be better and isn't it proper that we would continue to monitor these things and not just say, okay, we're good to go. So, the, you know, the key to that, and this is where the bridge of technology is in, in some forms and fashions, is, you know, are we going to implement maybe some social distancing program from a technology standpoint that might be able to help that? So, with BLE, I've talked to you, all of you probably have heard me talk about Internet of Things and technology. But low energy Bluetooth BLE has become a very, very affordable way of doing transmission of data. And in the, in the function of social distancing, this BLE technology has become very, very applicable to measuring how many people are in an area at any given moment. And even to the extent we did a presentation a while back, and, and again, because of privacy and different things, no one wanted to track someone continuously within three feet. But the idea of being able to put up something in a meeting room or in an area or in offices to know people there, they're occupying it and how many people are in that room based on limitation of, of people in an area. Um, these type of systems are not now available and they're very, very affordable. And so now if you have a room that you said there can't be more than 4 people in this room at any given time, based on social distancing and what we're trying to control. It can give you an alert and say, hey, we've got 5 people in this room. And the, and the side benefit is if someone does come up with the, the virus, uh, the you know now they have COVID, you can instantly track back to see who's been in contact uh, with that individual to be effective in any type of quarantining or actions beyond that. The other thing that is enormous is the PPE. Um, 
there are so many counterfeit 3M masks on the market today. Uh, it, it's it, it, and, I, and we know this because of our testing lab. It's absolutely incredible. Um, it is. Uh, it, it, there's no telling what people are assuming or think their masks are. And so certified masks that actually meet no, NIOSH criteria that have a regulatory piece to it that says you're going to validate your batches from the manufacturer. Many people are implementing that now in workspaces that are providing masks. Are these masks actually performing to standards? So it doesn't mean you have to test every mask, but from a quality standpoint, these masks can be tested by third party labs to verify that they're effective, including cloth masks to some degree with the ASTM uh, standard that came out 3502. Although that now is a moving target, but at least it gives some reference to what's going on from a particle standpoint that these masks are resisting. What, what size, how many, what's the efficiency of the mask? So there are standards now that people can test masks. So from a monitoring standpoint, we go, okay, we're gonna put everyone in these masks and we go down that path. Would it not make sense to audit those masks? Uh, even with our own labs, we have a service that wash our masks and we have you know, these rental masks and they're supposed to be maintained. And over time, as you wash a mask, does it stay effective? Does it still meet whatever uh, criteria we think this mask met? Uh, is there really any good criteria for PPE other than uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, going down the N95 route? I mean, so there's, and again, there's a lot of comfort issues. There's all those things you have dealt with forever but do we need to do a better job of monitoring PPE and what the claims are of these PPE with people walking around with masks that potentially don't do anything at all? There's already a question mark about the effectiveness in some situations, uh, but don't we really need to monitor that and, and not just SES, any, any accredited lab for these type of things, it makes sense to test them. So those are the main, main pieces of this, uh, you know, to be able to, to use ongoing monitoring person to person to make sure our PPE and with technology, social distancing is being implemented effectively, and we know it, and we're not assuming it, we're actually monitoring it. Well, this is the application that I pulled it up earlier. Again, it just shows you where people are located. It gives you how many people are in the room, and then it gives you the trends and the, and the near location. So that if you do have a near miss, you know who to talk to with regards to someone if they do have COVID that you can notify the people that have been in, in contact during that period of time to quarantine or get tested. Uh, and make sure every, everything happens quickly as opposed to it continues to happen without any notification. Again, aerialization, uh, you know, this is a, a part that we now, we, we are deploying very large numbers of our SmartSense technology into these applications uh, because they're web enabled. You can get your eyes on things very quickly. There are a lot of web enabled devices out there that can do some of this uh, type of work. But fresh air makeup, we all have been monitoring CO2 levels forever uh, to validate ventilation rates, uh, just for the purpose of occupancy, much less aerosol transmission of a virus. So CO2 is a great indicator of a buildup of, uh, you know, exhalation of people in an area, which now can be correlated also to not only CO2, there being an increase in people, but assumably if someone were to have COVID, it would be an increase of the aerosols which again, if we're monitoring these areas and we're very aggressive on setting our CO2 down to uh, maybe some new ASHRAE recommended levels or you know, just a baseline level that you wanna test to and be much more aggressive, uh, it's a great way to make sure that we're not creating a elevated level of exhaled uh, you know, uh, matter into an area. And then the obvious, other obvious thing is uh, particle matter or aerosol devices. Uh, some of these devices may only go down to three micron but some of them go to one micron. And the thought is, is that most of the aerosols uh, that carry the virus are gonna be in that size range or above three, uh, a majority of them. So again, this can help us as well uh, with being able to do that, uh, to monitor and make sure that we're trying to do everything we can in the air continuously, not just one time, walk in with a portable monitor and, you know, okay, we're good. We can put continuous monitors in to make sure that these things are happening, not unlike social distancing. And then the filter efficiency, again, particle meters uh, over time, if anybody's done continuous monitoring for a long period of time with, you know, in the case of thousands and thousands of points of data, you can develop baseline data that gives you really good indication of something not working effectively with a filter system. Um, and it's just, it's inherent. I mean, you can, 
you literally can draw that correlation. And there's automated programs, including what we have, LiveView, that can do different analytics to go, hey, you should go take a look at this. Uh, not have to look at the data continuously, but just get notification that something could be going on based on some analytics and historical data. And then again, the, everything to do with uh, bipolar ionization, hydrogen peroxide, all these other devices, are they effective? Are they still working? You know, we put them in, they're working, we follow the claim of the manufacturer, but are they still functional? How do we, how do we verify that? You know, do we do SARS-CoV-2 uh, and air? Do we do other things? Um, there are some ionization air devices that can tell you if the particles are joining together effectively based on the ionization. Uh, but is the efficacy still in, is still working? Is there anything changing that's creating a hazard? And we just believe that there needs to be more continuous monitoring for these type of things if they're installed to make sure they're still effective and they're not creating another hazard. So again, in continuous air monitoring, this is an example. There are a lot of different air monitors out there uh, that can be web-based. So within minutes, you know, cellular-based systems, you put them in, you're connected, you're up and monitoring, you're developing threshold levels and you get immediate notification if something goes above your threshold. Um, in our case, we have the ability of actually taking samples uh, to pull a sample and verify what a particle is or what, what is in the air causing that uh, increase in CO2 or PM level. Again, the ability to do SARS go to an air. I mean, that, that is a validation of different things, different um, you know, things that we're doing out there to try and treat the air. Uh, it's not a bad thing to do. Is it something we want to do continuously? Maybe not, but maybe from a uh, monitoring and QA standpoint, it's something we do want to do to validate uh, things are working effectively. Uh, hopefully there's no CoV-2 in there. That's what our goal is. And there's really no more direct measurement than that. Uh, and there's multiple labs that can do this, uh, this type of um, analysis. And then basically cleaning and disinfection, that's, that's just the key. And there's different methods. Again, we can use SARS-CoV-2 on services to do that. Uh, you know, again, you could use ATP, you can use other things to try and validate that things are cleaned effectively. But without, you know, we set these things up and we go, here's our recommendations, here you go. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we monitor these things and we give a solution to the client or to our, to our, to our, uh, our clients, uh, you know, our employees that we make sure things are being done effectively. Because um, anytime it could change and, and we all know that once something changes, our, our mitigation efforts are no longer in, in effect. The exposure pathways are back open and we end up with you know, the same issues we had at the outbreak. So we really think, uh, you know, it's critical that we do continuous monitoring and some way of auditing that these things are being followed effectively. And there's other things that people could be doing for sure, but these are the basic rough cut things that, you know, again, sitting with Ed and us going, man, you know, this, this is the IH world. This is the IH way. This is what everything is, is studied about. And, and IH should be involved in this heavily. And we think it's not, put, the cool thing about H is they don't like to put band-aids on. They like to put solutions on. Certified industrial hygienists look for a solution that's effective. And if you have a moving target, which this is, and it's not finite, and there's a lot of variables that can affect the pathways, uh, we've got to do everything we can to, to make sure we keep it mitigated because there's too many variables that can impact it we don't have control over. And then just one other thing that's interesting in the monitoring world that we uh, hear a lot about, and it's really becoming more and more popular, is actually monitoring wastewater uh, from a facility or, you know, depending on the sewage pathway and things like that. But it's a gross way to get a macro indicator that potentially there are people in these areas, uh, in these buildings that uh, are emitting, uh, you know, the virus through uh, their excrement and it's been proven to be effective. It's uh, in some cities and some buildings, housing areas, they're doing this to, to try and make sure that they've got a con control over that and that it's not running rampant in an area um, so this is becoming even a, a very interesting way of proactively monitoring uh, without, you know, getting into someone's household or doing air samples around a building or whatever, uh, that you're actually monitoring the wastewater to see if you start seeing occurrence of, of the virus. And again, there's multiple companies, labs that can do this work. Uh, collection is pretty simple. And uh, again, that's something that from a macro level might be of help with this monitoring process. And Kay, that's all I've got. Hope, uh, hope we get a lot of questions and we can have some discussion about it. Okay.
Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. Looks like we have uh, 25 minutes or so for questions. Um, I do have a few already. Uh, so the first one I have for you is um, at a large state university, how do we control so social distancing? Students live in large dormitories. We already do HVAC and other precautions. So, if, uh, you know, from from the perspective of no automation or any tools to, you know, that would be unacceptable to the population. The only thing you can do is train and monitor, you know, visually. Uh, if you can put badges on people, then it's very inexpensive, very inexpensive to put up uh, different uh, sensors and some web based tools and be able to monitor for accumulation in certain areas. So maybe you don't do that 100 percent, but you could do it in, in uh, certain locations that, you know, are gathering points. Uh, but other than that, it, that's really, you know, what we see in it anyway, and, and what other clients of ours, CIH is, you know, it's all about training, signage, and uh, reinforcement of, of the uh, of the mitigation method. Okay, great. Thanks, Ron. The next question I have comes from Adele, who asks, for restrooms without exterior exhaust or HVAC systems, are the standing air purifiers with HEPA filters and UV sufficient in the short term? So, uh, it, you know, it appears that bathrooms have been a big area for issues, um, and uh, there is some of that. Uh, but we, to date, we have not. I haven't. We haven't seen any tests that show any valid. We, we see valid uh, impact based on HEPA filters in an area. So, stand standalone HEPA filters, any sort of type of treatment system. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it refer to the manufacturer and get certified certified uh, results from what their claim is. Um, we just we've just had some uh, very unclear uh, uh, results from these uh, other mitigation tools, but we do have very positive results uh, with just the pure use of HEPA filters, based uh, floor based HEPA filters in a system. Um, anything else beyond that, it, it may help. UV may help. Uh, some other things, but um, the biggest impact we've seen to date has been just really good HEPA filtration, and that is a major gathering point. Uh, bathrooms potentially are one of the one of the worst areas for transmission. Okay, great, thank you. The next question is: uh, Should should the ASHRAE guidance be utilized by HVAC contractors? You may have answered this. I'm not sure. So there's some new new uh, there's some lower levels that have been put out by ASHRAE as guidance. Um, we we have a, a huge, enormous thousands of instruments that we're putting in some buildings. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting uh, is if you start to monitor continuously, your ability to draw a baseline and and manipulate or change HVAC systems and see resultant uh, concentrations of CO2 and particle matters, particle you know aerosols, particle levels, it it is it is such vastly different than just doing spot readings. It's a uh, it's an eye-opening experience is the right way to say it because you get full representation of what's going on in a facility every minute. And people look at that and it's, it's like a new thing. So the reality is if we're trying to achieve the lowest possible chance of uh, transmission by aerosol, you know, filtration through a PM monitor and CO2 monitoring you can become very, very aggressive in your in your protocol to get those levels down. And those two monitoring elements, by monitoring those two compounds or those two analytes or uh, items, you can really tighten up the band based on what you're achieving, trying to achieve the goal of zero transmission. So it, again, if you if you've never had large amounts of data in a situation like this to be able to see trends continuously over changing conditions, changing number of people, changing temperature, changing on and on, it, it's absolutely eye-opening, and I think you can. I think we can do better. I think we can. I think CIH is with their use of data and understanding the data can make it better than what ASHRAE would be. And I'm not saying don't go right to ASHRAE, but I think you can do better. I think you can do better for your for your employees and the occupants. My opinion on that. Okay. Great. And, and keep in mind, just real quick on the social distancing thing, the other question from the university. Installation costs, all the things on this technology has gotten so inexpensive. It, it's mind boggling how inexpensive it is to do this. So, 
you know, in, I think in the past people go, oh, it's, it's complex. There's all this stuff, but with, with web enabled technology, the ability to deploy a social distancing program that has some of this in it or real time monitors, it, it's just not that unaffordable or in some cases it's incredibly uh, efficient and for the cost, it's unbelievable. I mean, you, you, you got to get a handle on, you know, it's all cost related, right? We have to be cost conscious, but it, the cost has dropped so tremendously. It's, it's unbelievable how inexpensive it can be done. These things. Okay, great. Thank you. The next uh, question I have is from Gary, who's asking about information on testing for the virus in wastewater. Uh, can this be used as a control or early warning in a facility? And does SGS offer this test? So that's exactly right. That's um, there were several universities that did this out of the gate and validated that it can be an early warning uh, sign. And so SGS does do uh, wastewater testing. Um, and uh, again, there's other labs. Uh, this isn't an SGS pitch, uh, but th this this can be done and it can be done effectively. And it is a very interesting way of being able to detect uh, the you know the beginning of a spread. Uh, again, it's it's like everything else, and you know, CICs are great at looking at data. That's their job. And once you start getting a baseline of the wastewater, if there is any uh, virus, and you start to see an increase, uh, it, it can definitely be something that could pre-warn and allow time uh, to react as opposed to it being too late. And there are some major, major corporations implementing this, uh, you know, through through the United States. So it is it is a really neat macro, non-invasive way to start getting. An idea if you have a problem. Okay, great. Thanks. The next question I have is from Thomas, who's asking, um, are you able to provide any peer reviewed articles that specify if measured or detective co detected COVID in HVAC systems are viable? He says people like to say it's science and COVID has been detected on surfaces, but measures of viability and concentration are much more valuable for exposure assessment. So, um, uh, so the, all the all the SARS-CoV-2 tests in air or surface would be uh, it's it's only going to react to viable, to the viable virus, not non-viable, through the PCR method. So, um, you know that's all it's going to look at is the viability. If if somebody's trying to determine um, a treatment system, then we we actually do plates. And but we know that the virus uh, drops out very quickly, uh, or any bacteria, it, it dies quickly once it's on surfaces and, and depending on what else is going on in the environment, temperature, humidity. But it, the PCR tests come back, it's, it's purely viable uh, spores, if you will, or, or virus. It's not non-viable. It's not a total. I don't know if that answers the question for Thomas. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, Thomas, uh, go ahead and send me a chat uh, to all panelists uh, if you have anything to add or we can clarify that later. Um, but the next question I have comes from Isabel who asks, is testing air and surfaces necessary for general office environments or should these be done with confirmed COVID-19 patients? So we, it depends on the, on the, um, you know, the, the, this part of the, <laughs> this is part of the thing that's not inexpensive. Uh, if you start a full program and you, you want to do very aggressive uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing, which we had, a couple of clients that that happened, and we were running upwards of 300 samples a week in some facilities. Uh, it's not cheap, and so the benefit of that, uh, what was the benefit? Was it was it effective or not effective? And uh, there are some CIHs out there that could uh, hopefully reach out. You know, we we start to share this data. Uh, we can't share the data, but it may be something that um, that in your situation or how aggressive. Uh, either your client or your company wants to be about implementation of testing, uh, it is the one true direct measurement to say it is or isn't there. Um, most people honestly are, are doing spot checks to verify cleaning and uh, that things are working properly. And uh, it's, not all, it's not always uh, for SARS-CoV-2, it's using other technology to infer uh, that cleanliness or whatever. But we do have some people that get very aggressive about it, trying to grow confidence in their team that uh, they're doing everything they can to protect them. Is that true or effective? That's a, that's a CIH call for the situation, really. Okay, great, thank you. The next question I have is, do you recommend the use of bolometers? 
so uh, I'm that's up to the individual that's doing the testing. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of it being used for for uh, air changes and things like that. Uh, but the real question to me is is the um, fresh air makeup. I, I think I think the key to all of this is dilution uh, and dilution and filtration. And uh, that's my opinion. I'm voicing an opinion. And so many of you that are on this call know so much better than I do about this. But in my opinion, you know, uh, that's where that's where the sweet spot is and making sure that we're providing the dilution needed and we're doing the filtration needed. And again, the bear dart gives us that capability to verify it one time. We can continue to do bear dart studies, but we also can do real time monitoring to help shore that up. But at the beginning of the whole thing, using a very hard study to validate dilution and filtration uh, is a big win. It's it is a way to validate that whatever you thought was going to happen is truly happening. And in the case of the very hard studies we've done, uh, we're talking about saving millions and millions of dollars. Not very often do we in the IH world get to do something that would save a client money. Normally, we're just looked at as a, a, a hole that they have to do. They don't they got to spend money. But in the case of the very hard studies, you you literally can show your client and validate that uh, you know a big big expenditure in a certain area may not even be valid based on uh, on the bear art study itself so that's why we think it's uh, not just for the purpose of where where is it going how well is it working but do i really need to add MERV 13 do i really need to do whatever uh, and that's that's where you get the real world experimentation using bear art to figure that out okay thank you the next question i have comes from Alan, who's asking if you have any recommendation for a specific number of air changes per hour as a means of control. Um, he says, I have seen anywhere from three to seven to eight air changes per hour. Not sure if this is a great method to assure control. Yeah, that, that was what we talked about earlier. You know, the, the, the key is, is it fresh air makeup or are they just recirculating air? I, if it's recirculating air, depending on the filtration system, is that really enough? And again, the one we as CIHs, you know, it's that CO2 is a direct indicator uh, of accumulation of uh, exhaust from human beings. I mean, it's just it is. It, I mean, to the point where you could almost, uh, you know, you could tell how many kids are in a room based on the CO2 levels over a repetitive time, right? I mean, it, it's that effective to do that. So between uh, monitoring aerosol levels and monitoring uh, CO2. Um, I say that's a better method to make sure you're doing it right based on the, the load. Um, again, if you've never had a CO2 monitor in a room for a month continuously through different things, you will be blown away by the amount of data you get. It, it, it will it will change how you look at things. And it, and, and again, I what, our conversation today is really about monitoring. You know, we can we can set things up, we can get things designed properly, but from that point forward, we have a constant change in load. Industrial hygienists say, "Hey, if something changes, you need to re you need to retest. If, do we make a modification? We need to retest. In these buildings, things are changing continuously. The number of people, doors that are open, all these things are moving. They're not they're not uh, you know fixed. And I think that's why continuous monitoring has got to be a part of this. And so do a lot of other you know places, schools, or you know there's a lot of money allocated for these things. So uh, now it's a time after all these years of talking about indoor air quality that it actually brings a big a big plus to it." Okay, great. Thank you. The next question I have is how about foggers or misters? What chemicals are recommended and what frequency of treatment for common areas such as a large meeting room? Uh, again, that's a lot of people have adopted that. Airplanes have done that. Uh, you know, hotels, everybody's talking about that. Um, you know, again, is it, is it a subtle point? It, I keep bringing up Veridar only because it shows you where if anybody does have the virus it's going to go into the environment and it's going to settle somewhere and uh, aerosol tracing is a great way to validate where it's going so by testing areas seeing where accumulation points are you know cleaning effectively i mean all those kind of things are something that you know could be done daily right the cleaning portion uh fogging portion if it's been used if it hasn't been utilized do you need to do that is the hvac system bringing in aerosols from somewhere else in the building uh, all those things and um I think it's a combined solution to, 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 you know, based on application, CIHs are great on looking at the exposure methods, what's going on in this particular situation. Uh, you know, we have a lot of automated things we've done and, and a CIH will say to me, well, hold on a second, I need to be there to monitor, I need to make sure. 
man, this is one time I think that it's right on. If you want to do it effectively, you, you need to do all the right tools and do it at a pace that you recommend or you feel comfortable with in your in your uh, in your mind and your practice. Okay, great. I uh, actually have a few questions related to restrooms. I think um, it sounds like we've got um, some good interest in that. Um, so the first question I have is from David who asks what evidence exists that bathrooms have been identified as a major cause for virus transmission? Um, he's asking about aerosol or fomite transmission and if there's any published data that supports the assertion. So there, there is some data out there and I'll, uh, we actually um, had a project with a company that has uh, hand dryers and uh, all this data came out about different comments about uh, the effect of these hand dryers and if they actually act as a spreader. Uh, we then did, and again, this is data that if we have the permission from the uh, client and hopefully CIH is between these, you know, everyone we can share data, but uh, we did a huge amount of testing in bathrooms on walls uh, for fomite and different things. And um, it just appears that ventilation in a bathroom typically is, was not designed effectively. And uh, I'll get the, the, the people that are involved in this and, and get some of this data if you'd like, uh, but historically they're poorly ventilated and not all the, all of them, but we also have seen through some Veridar studies that they become an accumulation point for where air ends up from HVAC system uh, for whatever reason. And so any of those kind of things we're glad to share with you, uh, but um, it makes sense that if someone does have the virus, they go to the bathroom, the minute you flush a toilet, it aerosolizes. It, it's just, it, it, it is an area of concern for sure. And uh, the poor ventilation typically in these areas, as Adele mentioned earlier, uh, is probably one of the biggest issues. But I can share that data. I, I, if whoever that is, let me know. And, uh, or if the group wants to see it, I will come up with that data that we did have in this one uh, testing program and, and uh, I think it's public data. I don't think it's private. I can share that with everyone, what I do have. Okay, thanks, Ron. Um, I think uh, just if you had anything to add, um, I've had some questions about um, restrooms related. Um, they've got very poor ventilation and a shared HVAC system. Um, just if you had any other recommendations to add about that. Uh, well, it's so, uh, What's going on in the past, you know, there, there's all kinds of different treatment systems that are being put in these bathrooms. There's a lot of uh, things that are supposed to, you know, uh, help reduce virus load in bathrooms. And um, so the testing we've done and everything in them, you know, it is just a validation of what's going on in that in that restroom. Uh, the big one is airflow. Again, you know, CO2 aerosol measurements, Barrett Art study, aerosol tracing. Um, you know, putting in filtration, that appears to be the solution to some of this. There are some other, like, I don't know if you've seen some of the bathrooms where they've actually put in these special exhaust systems to draw the air directly out of the stall. I mean, there's been some very aggressive things in this area. So, um, you know, if you Google, uh, you know, these type of systems in bathrooms, you'll you'll start seeing some of the crazy things that are happening. I'm saying crazy only because it's it's unique to us or not unique, but we, we've never had that before. You'll see some designs of ventilation systems that you could have never imagined. Um, so, but you know, if you, if you want, you know, if, if you're a CIH and you want some advice on that, we can, uh, we can give you some advice, uh, or, you know, if you're with a end user and you'd like a, a consultant, a CIH to get in touch with you, we can uh, help you in your area with, uh, one of our clients. We have thousands of them and we're, we're glad to refer them over since Golson doesn't do, we don't do any consulting, right? So, and we only know what we know because we, we have the privilege of dealing with what it is now at 20,000 clients, 10,000 clients on any given day, 3,000 any given day. So it's really cool to be able to pass this information along and we wanna share with everyone anything we can that'll help the group and help the AIHA team members. So. Great, thanks, Ron. Um, I have another question asking if you have any opinion on cooling towers, um, asking about Legionella, I guess if there's anything to be concerned about there. Well, so um, yeah, so a lot of buildings that have been shut down um, are not not operating like they were fully when fully occupied, or uh, you know during this pandemic. So obviously, Legionnaire is one of the things that's on the, on radar uh, for testing. I didn't put that in this talk, 
because uh, we're chasing directly down the exposure route for SARS. So, but exactly right, Legionella is something that probably needs to be uh, checked and validated uh, once everything starts firing back up on these facilities that have been dormant or not run at full capacity where they were running prior to the pandemic. Okay, thank you. The next question I have comes from Patrick, who's asking if you have any comments on the CDC guidance, um, interim public health recommendations for fully vaccinated people and how that would relate to hangers and large unconditioned space. Uh, I don't have really. Um, hopefully, you know, there's so many, there's misinformation now about everything to do with vaccines, right? So um, let's hope we, Let's hope it works the way everybody's hoping it will work and everything will get back to normal. I, I, I can't comment on any of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question I have comes from Barry who asks if we have reduced occupancy in a building, is the CO2 level truly indicative of effective ventilation? Um, so if you have reduced people, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, if you have the right monitors in the right place um, and you've reduced occupancy, then your CO2 level should be lower. So it inherently should follow the thought that we don't want a lot of people into a building exchanging air. So it's sort of the, you know, that's one way to mitigate is to reduce the load, which is the, the person that generates CO2. So it, it's sort of hand in hand, uh, in my opinion. And um, if you've done a lot of CO2 studies, continuous long-term, you'll, you'll see a variant. You'll see the variance. I mean, if you have three people in a 20,000 square foot building, you, you may not see a variance. But at the same time, then we're achieving our goal, which is to reduce exposure and aerosol release to the air. So it's kind of hand in hand and creates the situation we really want. So. Okay, thank you. I got um, some follow up questions from Thomas from earlier. Um, one, I guess, area for clarification he asked. Did you say that the analytical method SGS uses for PCR analysis only detects viable COVID? So from my understanding from our analyst, the if it's not viable, it will the PCR portion of it, which is the RQRT part, will not show up in the test. And I can get I can get our analyst to, to uh, put out some information on that. Uh, but I can uh, I I'm not the analyst on that piece, but that's what we've been told. It is just the viable. Okay, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, the last question I have is how does this compare to the well building program? So again, well and lead, those are all really good. There's the one thing to be aware, of, like the thing you see advertised heavily by well, and you know, it's nothing wrong with it, but that's not even an on site, typically not even on site. That's a questionnaire that the building owner fills out. So there's different levels of well. Um, so I think everyone has to be very aware of what it means when someone says, oh, yeah, we're well certified. There's different levels of certification. Uh, the other thing I think from a CIH standpoint, I think it's super incredible that CIH should be, be really pushing for continuous monitoring. This, this, is, this is truly what we're dealing with. We know what the exposure routes are. And as CIH is, because everything is moving as a CIH, you got to look at it and go, hey, this is, Everything's moving, unless you can confirm that it's not changing. Uh, there's, it's moving nonstop. The, the source could or could not be there. The source may be there 10 times more than not yesterday. It, you know, all these things that are variables, that's what drives studies for exposure. And to me, it's super important that we assert that for it to be done correctly. Um, and it's up to the CIHs and they understand it to, to you know, implement that how they see fit based on whatever the recommendations are to get people back in buildings and, and get the design portion of it done. Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I know we had a lot of different questions, um, so we will be providing all of those to SGS Galson and Ron, um, just in case we missed yours or didn't get to it. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know that. And I also wanted to thank Ron McMahon for his presentation, to SGS Galson for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants. Please join us for our next Synergist webinar on Monday, May 10th, when speakers from SKC will present Measuring Occupational Noise and Easier Approach. Thanks to everyone again, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. 
All right, thank you everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with that link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.